Shalom, Dr. Diana Dai here with Foundations in Torah. Welcome to this week's Torah portion, Re'eh, which means to see or to behold. So this Torah portion is filled with lots of interesting details. I'm going to show you how those details connect to the temple. I wanted to back up and kind of look at the overview and paint with sort of broad brush strokes here instead of getting into the minutia and the details. And so we find here an element in this passage which I thought was interesting the concept of the place, and I'll talk about that more in just a second. So again, many details, and all of them relate to the context of the temple. So we have the description of clean and unclean animals. We have the blessings and curses from Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval. We have the discussion of the tithing of the grain and the oil and the wine and the firstborn of the flock, etc. All of these are in the construct of the temple. We have uh, a discussion about prophets and not serving other gods. We have the Shemitah, the every seven years, and I've uh, explained numerous times that the number seven is a temple number. So the Shemitah is in that context, taking care of the needy, etc., etc. Releasing the slaves after six years, and in the seventh they would be free. Again, this idea of, of six and then the Sabbath is a seven, which indicates a temple dedication. We have the Pesach described here, the seven days of Passover. So we eat the matzah for six days, and on the seventh we have a holy convocation. Uh, and it in repeatedly mentions this place where God chose to put his name. We have counting the seven weeks till we get to Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Sevens, if you will. And we have Sukkot. All of this is described in this Torah portion. So we have the seven days of Sukkot, gathering the produce from the threshing floor and from the wine press. So all the festivals are in uh, structures of seven. And again, the context that is, is the temple. In fact, it's all filled with temple language. But the idea here is to see the place of God's presence. And the first indication we have of that is in the story of Abraham, who, if you'll recall, when he was taking his son Isaac up to the place. And the place, in Hebrew, makom, Hamakom is actually a name for God, but the place on top of Mount Moriah was where Abraham would dedicate and give up his son on the altar, uh, Itzhak, that is. But if you find, uh, it, it tells us that Abraham named the place, and the place, Hamakom, what he called it was, on this mountain Adonai will be seen. So isn't that interesting in relationship to uh, this particular Torah portion? Of course, they're crossing over the Jordan River, and the, the land becomes a pattern of the temple with three, three areas, uh, three boundaries, if you will. So you have the, the inner uh, sanctuary, the inner courtyards, and then you have the sort of outer courtyards, and then you have what's outside. Uh, so there's three layers or three levels. So they're crossing over the Jordan River, and the Jordan actually represents a gate, as if you had in the temple. There were, by the time of the second temple period, we had 13 gates. But crossing over indicated crossing over a threshold. So entering the land, the land was holy, and it was the it represented the sanctity of God, and it re represented a temple pattern. So they're crossing over, and it, and it tells us something interesting. Um, talks about the two mountains, Gerizim and Abal, and it, dis, it says that they were uh, in the direction of the sunset or the setting sun, which would have been the west. And this is the orientation that we have of the temple. Uh, temples in the ancient Near East were all uh, built in this orientation, but that the entrance would be on the east and then the Holy of Holies would be on the west. So they were in an east-west orientation. And of course, it describes these two mountains as being in the west, kind of in the place where the Holy of Holies was. Now, out of the Holy of Holies came the Word of God. And so here we have the blessings and the curses, which are the Word of God, in the area located to the west of the land. And so the one thing that has to be done as they cross over, they cross a threshold into the land, is the enemies have to be destroyed, because you cannot build a temple until the enemies are destroyed and put underfoot. And so there's this in, we, we see a discussion here about the nations and, and, and their gods and not worshiping them and their temple icons, etc. But once those enemies have been routed, rest comes, and that's our de description of Shabbat, Shabbat, and the temple can be built. And so they are to do then what is according to their covenant agreement. Now, covenant agreements were always made in doorways or gateways. And so we see this covenantal agreement with Joshua as they cross over. Remember, he 
builds the stones there, the 12 stones. So a covenant agreement was happening here. Now, in, in the ancient culture, the Hebrew people were always commanded to dedicate uh, their doorways to the living God. So the doorways were called the mezuzot. And, of course, they would put the name of their God in the doorways. Again, this idea of the place where God chose to put his name. So the name in the ancient cultures of the particular God was put in the doorway. And now we see that the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, is the, is the covenant statement that, that indicates the witness to the, the, the God in the, in the doorway, in this case, our God, uh, yod heh vav -He. But the, the representative of the God would stand in the doorway and be a representative for him. And so there's a whole teaching, really, on the, on the prominence and importance and significance of the doorway or the threshold or the crossing over through the gate. So one who crossed over uh, received new life, shelter, protection, refuge. And again, the inscriptions in the doorway testified to the passageway to pass. Basically, the spiritual principle is of crossing over from death to life. The doorpost was the place where the two parties then would be yoked together, as we see with Joshua crossing over the, uh, the Jordan. And now the nation is yoked together with their God. And so a covenant is something that would bind uh, two parties. And again, the name of the God was inscribed. <laughs> excuse me. The name of the God was inscribed in the doorway. So this is a, this is a very important uh, uh, point to be to be understood. So then when you're in the doorway, you become the citizen, if you will, of that kingdom or of that God. So now they have declared their citizenship and their allegiance to God himself. Again, they've crossed over. Now, the one thing I, I kind of want to point out here is the use of the word, um, the place. And if you go through this passage, uh, it's, it's um, a form of the place is used 17 times, but we can throw out two of them because the two times it's used is referring to the place where the nations are. And so that leaves us with the number 15. There are 15 times in this passage that the place, Hamakom, the name of God, the name of where, the place where he would put his temple, is used. And those of you who've studied with me know that the number 15 is one of the most important numbers in Scripture. Uh, yod Hey, the name of God, Yah, has a value of 15. And then we find that the temple itself is structured around the number 15. There were 15 superintendents in the temple. There are 15 songs of ascent as they went up at festival time. There were 15 steps before the Nicanor Gate. And all the festivals, there's a pattern of 15 in the festivals, the time of redemption, the 15th of the first month, the 15th of the second seventh month, etc. I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but it is very significant. And so this is the place where God chose to put his name, specifically on Mount Moriah, but in the center of what would be the temple uh, construct. It goes all the way back to Genesis 1-3, talking about the seas being gathered in, and then the dry ground appearing, and the dry ground always signified a temple. And so the land appeared and a temple would be built, and you can read about that in, Genesis, in the first chapter of Genesis. And so in the midst of all that, in the midst of the land, is the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem and the temple are kind of synonymous terms, but always represent the temple. So come to this place where God will put his name. And it's there that you make your offerings, all your, the various offerings that are described in this Torah portion uh, that would include all your voluntary offerings, your burn offerings, your sacrifices, your tenths, um, uh, those that you give uh, from, the, from the heart, those that you are required to give, the firstborn of the cattle, the sheep, etc., etc. And it talks about you eating there in the place of God's presence. So in the ancient, in the ancient temple, and really going back all the way to the garden, the eating in the, in the construct of the temple services, etc., was the highest form of worship. Once there's no temple standing, obviously eating isn't, doesn't fulfill that. But in the ancient temple, first temple, second temple, eating was the highest form of worship. And this was the responsibility of the priests, and that was to eat. And so we, they brought all these various offerings for eating purposes. And so they were to bring them as God ordered them to the place where his presence would sit. And they were to, de to dedicate their very best to God. So the first fruits of their harvest and the first uh, 
fruits of, of their agriculture and the first fruits of, of the priesthood, etc. Everything, the tenth, would be dedicated to God. And that they were to rejoice in the, in the presence of God. Now, clearly in exile we don't have a temple, and but the principle in my mind still applies. So where is the place of the presence of God? To me, the center of his will is the place of his presence. That's where, if we want to be in the place of the presence of God, then we need to be in the center of his will because we don't have a physical temple standing. We don't have the whole, the whole complex, the institution functioning. So where do we go? We go to the center of his will. And the only way we're going to find out his will for us is in the scriptures itself. And so the center of his will represents his throne. And in a sense, spiritually speaking, that throne uh, should be in our hearts. That should be the place. And the throne represented the world to come, the world outside of time. And we've been regenerated by our faith in Messiah. And so in a sense, that throne should be inside us and should be in our hearts. Now, of course, everything won't be restored until this world goes away. But I would say to help us see this in a bigger picture. That's, that's the temple that we want to understand at this point. I'm not uh, saying you shouldn't learn as much as you can about the temple, but since we don't have a physical one, to examine your heart and make sure that you're in the center of his will, especially going forward in these difficult days, because you can run and hide and do all these physical things, but if you're not in the center of his will, uh, his, pur his purposes will not be worked out in your life. The place of prov provision, protection, and where all things function is the center of his will. So make sure in that regard that, that you are indeed in the center of his will. We'll see you next time. Shalom.